we'll come to the third and the final lecture on the education research basic series in fact this is uh, only a practical guide and it's not a lecture to teach education research this is the third part and uh, we are going to continue from the first and the second part i think i recommend for you to watch first and second part because because it's uh, it's it's a continuation of the uh, first and second lecture to the third lecture darwaj education research conference 2020 and in the first lecture i have told you that it's a process we are going towards this date when we have this national conference on education research. We are following this DRC research training program. This is the second, this is the third lecture. Uh, and uh, we have the series in Sinhala as well as in Tamil. And I have mentioned that this is a process of uh, learning to practice learning through practice to gain experiential learning where you have to learn some facts by lectures practice reflect and you get feedback and reflect and you perform and reflect and and i we hope that you become a researcher you uh, going through the entire process of research in education in fact we stated at the beginning it's a matter of becoming a teacher. It's not knowing about the subject. We know we need you to become experts in subject by knowing it, having deep understanding about the knowledge, and then applying that knowledge and analyzing that knowledge, and then creating new knowledge related to your subject. So you become an expert in the subject. Similarly, you need to know about teaching various methods of teaching, various methods of assessment, curriculum development, and all sorts of things. And knowing alone is not enough, and you need to become expert by practicing, by applying that knowledge, by analyzing that knowledge, by synthesizing that knowledge. So you have to go through this process of knowing, understanding, and becoming a teacher. That is your life success. Unless you try to become that teacher with that deep understanding, the deep, deep change in behavior, changing your lifestyle, you can't become a teacher who is enjoying, who is thrilled by the experience of teaching and by seeing your uh, outcome of your effort. So that is what education research means. And it's a process not just to do for a one conference, but to incorporate in your lifestyle and constantly you research, you check whether you are doing can be better, can improve, whether you are doing it correct, and self-reflection. It's a matter of looking at yourself, whether you are doing it all right. So that is what is meant by action research. So we hope you are going through this process and have that attitude of becoming a researcher becoming a person who search uh, about yourself and understanding about yourself and constantly improving and progressing in your career. If you do that, the education will contribute to change the world. Again, I think I mentioned this. The only thing I know is that I don't know. I know nothing. And then Lord Buddha says that if you know that you don't know, you are a wise person. So therefore, you should search for truth. Action research is that you do not stop in one place. You continue to search, search for better, search for the truth. We have gone through several steps in the last two lectures, selecting a topic thinking of an intervention and what outcomes we can expect. And we thought how to measure them as well. What is our objective? In fact, 
the objective in action research is somewhat similar to writing uh, your hypothesis or research question. But we are not using the word hypothesis here. Uh, I invite you to think of what hypothesis is, what null hypothesis is, but in action research, we are not keen to have a hypothesis and prove a hypothesis or disprove a hypothesis. We thought of research methodology and what tools can be used and selecting a sample. And then we stopped at writing a proposal. Now today we will be mainly focusing on, on how to ensure the quality of data collection, quality of research, and then talk about data analysis, and then talk about how to write an abstract and research paper and the presentation and publication that is targeting at our uh, conference on 29th October. So these are topics that we have gone through already. The research topic, innovations and expected outcomes, objective, methodology, sample and writing a proposal. Now, it's essential for us to ensure the quality of data collection, quality of research. And now you have written a proposal, you have some idea, you have, uh, you have seriously thought of the research. Now we need to sort of make sure that it is of high quality and it has credibility that can be accepted by people. So, so therefore, there are a lot of uh, recheck that you need to do on your proposal and what you have done. In fact, this real process of rechecking happens uh, if there is a process of ethical clearance that should be there in education research. Uh, but in our system, we do not have a proper system, but then probably you need to write the proposal and show it to your friends, your principal, your superiors, uh, get their opinion, get their approval. And that is what we call as gatekeepers approval, uh, which is important. And that is one of the way of ensuring the quality of data collection, the quality of research. Now, to ensure the accuracy and quality of information, we need to look at the alignment of data and objectives. Now, say for example, somebody want to do a descriptive analysis of some phenomena, something that is happening in the class, you can collect, gather data, simple data. But if you want to analyze if you want to explore the same phenomena, say the reason for students not coming to the class, counting the number of students who are not coming to the class and checking their age and sex is not enough. If you want to explore the reasons, then probably you have to go for a qualitative assessment and you have to go for a focus group discussion. So that is what I meant by alignment of data and objective. And if you want to do uh, improve the uh, improve the percentage of students coming to the class, then you have to do the pre-test and the post-test. And because you want to improve, you want to find out, explore the reasons, probably you have to use a mixed method. So alignment of data collection and objectives is important. And then you have to select the correct and representative samples. Say, for example, you want to you analyze the reasons for duration of attitudes of year five students in Sri Lanka. So you can't just do it by taking a group of students in your school. If you want to, if you want to uh, use that data to talk about entire population of Sri Lankan year five students, then you have to take a representative sample. Now representative sample uh, the, it should be adequate, adequacy of sample, and that is a statistical evaluation, and that probably you can't do it with just 25 students or 50 students, may not be even 100, and, and, and it all depends on the, how to select the sample. So adequacy of sample also is important for quality of your research. And then you need to design proper tools. What do I mean by that? Now, either you want to take quantitative data, 
or qualitative data, you have to have data collection tools, properly designed data collection tools. Uh, unless you have quality data collection tools, the data that you gather may not be really what you intend to gather because you have your data collection form, either uh, your assistant who is collecting data or the student who is completing that data sheet may not understand the same thing. So if you really want the data that you intend to collect, you have to be very clear and very precise. And in fact, you should test your tools before you are applying it in a bigger population. So designing the tool is important. And it's important to be meticulous about uh, uh, data collection. You can't just rush through. You need to take enough time and you have to do it carefully. So all that is very important for accuracy of data collection. I have got this from Creswell, who is an expert in qualitative data. I suggest you all to read uh, the number of uh, YouTube uh, presentations by Creswell. Uh, supposed to be one of the greatest person in qualitative research in the world today. He suggests if you want to have a validity of qualitative research, now we are talking about qualitative re research, uh, it should be valid. What do you mean by valid? Validity means it's correct, it is acceptable, it represents the real population. So it, it's a valid. And for that, you have to have prolonged engagement. You can't just do a very short interaction and maybe non-interaction is not enough and you have to have several interactions. So prolonged engagement is important. And rich and thick descriptions. You know the qualitative research is where you describe things, you, you talk, you engage in a conversation. It has to be deep and it has to be thick and it should be very descriptive. Triangulation is another method of ensuring the validity of qualitative research, where it's not only your qualitative method, but also you have another method of with quantitative and another qualitative method of sort of, you know, not just one method, a couple of methods you bring together uh, and then prove the same case. Member checking is where you have your qualitative data gathering, you summarize them and you ask the members to see whether you have got the conclusion that they also agree with. Because in a qualitative research, say for example, you have done a focus group discussion, you come to conclusion and you summarize it and show them back and they say, no, no that's not what we meant. So the, the member checking is important. Discrepant information is also important because you have a theme and you have some assumption before you go for the research. And it's, it's important to describe a common trend as well as if there's a discrepancy in information. One person may totally disagree on what the others are telling. It's important to inform that. Clarifying research bias, as I said earlier, you may go in with the bias and then you need to express that and say that you have that bias and, and then say that's the basis of your work and so therefore the reader can analyze it in that context. Peer briefing is important. You can present your finding to your peers and then discuss with them and clarify it. And then in fact, you can use external auditors we are uh, somebody who will who check the uh, your findings. Just it's important to sort of remember that secret in education lies in respecting the student. I think that's very important. And in teacher-centered teaching, basically what we do is we don't respect students and the fundamental of student center, learn center teaching is you see the you respect your students. Now researcher bias is an important detriment to the good quality research. And it's because of the attachment. It's your attachment is not only for material thing, you are attached to your opinion, your ideas. 
dhamma tanha, that's what the Buddha says. The root of suffering is attachment, and we are, we are attached to certain facts, but we have to come out from that if you want to be a good researcher. Never get too attached to someone because attachment leads to expectations, and expectations lead to suffering. Okay, now we'll go to the next topic. Hmm? Try to analyze and interpret our data. Now, data analysis, we have already talked about quantitative data and qualitative data. We'll look at quantitative data. Uh, we can present quantitative data in a raw data in a table. You just put them in a table. You may have cross tabulation, say, for example, you uh, talk about the height and weight, and you talk about the males and females in two columns. Or else, you have your height, weight, head circumference, or chest circumference, waist circumference, BMI value as rows, and then you can have uh, uh, columns, uh, age groups, less than five years, five to 10 years, 10 to 15 years, 15 to 20 years, like that. So you can tabulate them as raw data. Uh, that again can be meaningful. You can show that the numbers are like that, but then uh, that is that does not show a proper understanding. That does give a proper understanding unless you give a descriptive analysis where you talk about the proportions and percentages. The two here, and then while doing that, you can talk about the mode, frequency, minimum number, and maximum number. It's use the more descriptions and then you can go for what is called central tendency you present the mean median and standard deviation there are many other statistics in central tendency that's a descriptive analysis and then you may have to go for inferential analysis where you try to test the significance uh, test and show that this group is different from the other group and this group is special and things like that. And where hypothesis testing also comes in. Or else you may be that you want to show that there's an association. Say intelligence is associated with the height of a child. So likewise, uh, association or correlations. I'm not going to go into details and you will have another lecture on statistics later. Uh, for the moment, just to have outline and have a sort of, you know, I just want to induce you to start thinking of, on this uh, this aspect of data analysis. For us to have a good understanding about data analysis, we should understand what the kinds of data that we have. Data can be divided into two groups, categorical data or numerical data. The categorical data are quantitative data and uh, uh, numerical data, sorry, Categorical data are qualitative data and numerical data are quantitative data. Qualitative data can be just nominal, where you have name categories like sex, uh, sex, the color, the ethnic group, and things like that. It's only a name. Very interesting to say that it's only a name, isn't it? Your ethnic group and your, your color and your village and all that is only a name nominal and ordinal they are categories and they have an implied order the short the tall uh, or, or or say for example those who totally disagree disagree agree totally agree in that order they are, they are ordinal and then uh, when it comes to numerical data you have discrete data uh, you have numbers and then you have continuous where it's a, it's a normal mathematical numbers where you have uh, uh, proportions, you have a true zero value and uh, you can uh, subtract, divide, multiply, do all the all sorts of statistics with continuous, they are, they are numbers. Again, the, what the difference between the discrete numerical data and continuous numerical data is difficult to explain quickly, better to think of it and try to understand. 
one important point is that in discrete numerical data, there's no true zero value, like body temperature. Uh, here we present this uh, from the web, and you have nominal data, ordinal data, interval data, and ratio data. Uh, they are nominally named classifications, mutually exclusive categories, ordered ordinal, or relative ranking. Numbers are not equidistant, zero is arbitrary here. Interval data, that's rank ordering, approximately equal intervals can have negative numbers. And then uh, ratio are true numbers. They are equal intervals, absolute zero is there. So example, it's a nominal is gender is example, and then the ordinal is the pain scale. And interval is exam marks, and the length and weight are ratio. So central tendency is measured by more than nominal data. For example, you will say that uh, majority were majority were males. The majority is coming from Western province and things like that more. And then ordinal data, you can tell about the majority and what is in the center median. And then uh, interval data, you can calculate the mean here. And uh, here also you can calculate the mean. In nominal data, there's no order limited in descriptive ability. Uh, ordinal data, not necessarily equal intervals between two numbers. Uh, and here, the interval data, the exact uh, difference between the number is known and zero is arbitrary, and ratio is zero. There's a zero. So data analysis can be descriptive analysis or inferential analysis. And descriptive analysis is, again, I'm talking the same thing. You have the central tendency, mean, mode, and median. And you can give uh, percentages, and you can give the dispersion, how much the data is closer to the central tendency, closer to the mean, by giving the range, quartiles, variance, and standard, standard deviation, and distribution. I think I'm leaving these things for you to follow in the lectures coming later uh, in statistics. There are many inferential statistics, and I'm, I'm not going to talk about any of these things, and uh, you will learn them later. Now, the next thing is analysis of qualitative data. Now, we talked about the quantitative data. Now it's about qualitative data. Qualitative data, there are three types of analysis you can do. One is what is called framework analysis, where you have a framework. Say, for example, uh, in qualitative data, you have a, a written script of a conversation or a long essay that was written and a lot of uh, descriptive uh, narratives there. And you have a framework you can say uh, statements indicating dislike towards this process of teaching or statements indicating uh, uh, liking towards this process of teaching, a statement indicating suggestions for improvement, statements indicating suggestions for uh, to discontinue and suggestions for assessment. So you have a framework and then you put uh, words into that framework. So that's the framework analysis. Second approach is open thematic exploratory analysis. You read the script and then you underline uh, expressions, pieces of information, and then collect them and then uh, try to analyze. You may use both. We'll see, uh, we'll take an example now here. Uh, when you have to analyze, you recognize codes. Say, for example, here we have various codes coming from a focus group discussion. Say, for example, lack of uniform is a code. No school books is a code. Lack of school fees, school levies, worry, mind elsewhere, 
fired in school, headache. Now this quote coming from a uh, from a school survey to find out reason for not attending school. Now when you analyze these quotes, you can lump together and then recognize basic themes. Now that is thematic analysis. Now lack of uniform and no school books indicate that working street children lack school material. Lack of fees and school levies, there are financial problems. And worry and mind elsewhere, they have uh, uh, they have worries, they have problems. And uh, tired in school and headache, children are exhausted. And then those basic themes can be again lumped together to organizing themes where yeah, you can you can think of how to support them. Working street children cannot afford to go to school, so there are financial problems. Organizing theme is whether providing funds is going to help. And then there are stresses. Uh, so the second organizing theme is there are stress. So whether we can do something to alleviate stresses by educating, providing facilities, and things like that. So all that put into the into a global theme struggle of working straight children. Here I have tried to give you a, another example of imaginary study where you do a focus group discussion with five students and you ask the question and uh, why are you not coming to the school? Say year 13 school children, uh, they are, they, they, this is what they say. You talk with them and you allow them to talk, you ask this question, why are you not coming to the school? And this is what they say. In fact, in a proper qualitative study, this will be much longer, uh, much, there are, maybe, there are several questions that you ask. I'm just taking one example. Say, first student says, what is school? Now, when you are doing a focus group discussion, I think it's better to write down uh, the narrative on their own words, the words they uttered without making any changes. So that's what I have done. Second student, Mata Nanti and Lokuma Prasnimi and Doom. Mata Mami Kabal and the Light School. Third Matanang or Kotam Vada on thy pansel teanaker. Mom Mahanam in Dana Kila Hitan Depa, Mamida Sel Pansel Tiana, Gins Aduka Tela Dalaino, Anikila to TV came on the program Tina, Iganagana Pudu. Student number five. Mamanang Skolianiki Pavla Gudakal, Amma Gedriti Amatuan Nigata, Apiana, the Tegan Hitan Natepe, Giva Tanakin, get you there for it. So, having read all these things, now see what I have done. I have recognized quotes. Bus sekatama kuchchara vieda makyana. How much we have to spend for bus? Look where that came and nothing much happening. We are only listening to the, uh, the false stories of uh, friends. And then you have to buy new clothes. You can earn something. I earn something. You can get, you can meet your friends. School is part, and I am tired of the school now. School is boring. I prefer to go to the temple. I go to temple. I have good programs in the TV. School and again, Pavel Agodakala, tired of going to school. I learn something. So I have sort of recognized some quotes. If somebody else is doing the same thing, might find different quotes. That is why there's the there's a research bias in uh, qualitative studies, and that is how that is why you it's better for you to have uh, two independent researchers doing the analyze analysis part of it. And then what I have done is I have 
written those pieces of information and put on a table and these are the sort of uh, uh, points that I have got. And then I will look at it, that I have put different colors now say this, uh, I'm earning something, I can help father. So one of the reasons probably is that they, are, they prefer to help the income of the family. Now in blue, uh, can learn something by watching TV, I go to temple, I learn to learn. So seem to be doing something productive at home. And then uh, this one, uh, the, the school is boring, I'm tired of it, uh, no point in what we learn and we only listen to the uh, bore stories of friends. So uh, the coming to school is not useful, that's what they say. So we'll see. Now if you look at those, now these three expenses for the bus, you need to have new clothes, money for meals. So there are issues with expenses and then uh, can help the father, I earn something, need to earn money. And uh, I am getting on with, I meet friends and uh, I go to temple, they give priority to other, other activities. And school is boring, tired of it, it's not enjoyable coming to the school. And then you can learn by watching the TV, learn to cook, and they are using uh, time spent at home usefully. And only bogus stories and no point learning and it's not useful. So now we have got some basic codes here. And then we have got organizing themes. There are economic problems, students' attitude problems, and the school is not productive. So now we have organizing themes and there are things that we can do. How can we attend to this and how can we change the students' attitudes and how can we make uh, coming to school more productive? So uh, that's an example of qualitative research, but then there are a lot more to learn. And I think you need to sort of work with your mentor and sit and discuss your research. And I have mentioned earlier, qualitative research can mix with quantitative research and where you, you call it mixed method. And there are six types of mixed method research, convergent design, explanatory sequential design and exploratory sequential design, experimental design, social justice design and multi-stage need assessment method. I'm not going to go into much details, but just mention a few things which I have done earlier also. In uh, convergent design, your quantitative analysis, statistical analysis, as well as qualitative analysis happens simultaneously, parallelly, but then the, you will merge your ideas to arrive at a conclusion. So this conclusion is much stronger, better, valid, because you have two methods supporting the same thing. In exploratory sequential method, you explore the problem with qualitative data by a focus group discussion or in-depth interview. You gather data and you learn about the issue. And now you plan what type of sample that you have to have and what type of questionnaire you have to design your qualitative data, your codes and your themes will help you to design the data collection survey forms uh, for a quantitative data collection. So now you go and do the quantitative data that will bring about the conclusions supported by both studies. Explanatory sequential analysis where you do the quantitative analysis first and then you understand there's a problem. Say for example, uh, uh, the home environment is a problem and home environment, the, the burden at home is the reason for not coming to school and you do focus group discussions and qualitative data assessment. You select the correct sample, you design your qualitative data collection framework uh, to complete your study. Now, having done that, next thing would be 
to do your research. Now, doing the research, data collection, data analysis have been done, and you need to write an abstract now. And probably this is the next most important that you should do. Well, it's not possible for you to sort of get you to sit and write an abstract, and you should do it. But I'll just tell you a few tips uh, with regard to our our education research conference. And I think we have several deadlines now. We have to finish it by 20th October. Uh, yes, 20th October uh, to present on 29th. And there are deadlines. And wordly is a word limit always. And you have to write an introduction, write your objective, write your methodology, and then results and conclusions and recommendations. So you have to do it within 300 words. It's not easy. Uh, what do you write in the introduction? You write basically the reason for you doing the research as well as existing theory. Say, for example, uh, somebody is, uh, will say, doing a research to show, to say that, uh, 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 we'll say, uh, activity-based learning enhance the capacity to answer higher order questions among students. Say, your introduction may be that uh, you have observed that the student's performance in responding to higher order questions are poor than recall questions, and activity-based learning supposed to enhance the ability to analyze and apply uh, knowledge. So therefore, you have done this study. So your objective is to improve students' ability to answer higher order questions by adopting activity-based teaching methods. Methodology. Uh, you might write that uh, in such and such a section in the in the science class or math class. Uh, we have shift the methods of teaching from traditional didactic method to activity based learning and such and such activity was utilized to teach such and such concepts in math uh, to teach. And then uh, this section was taught traditionally this section was taught uh, by uh, activity method, and then the marks obtained for two sections were analyzed and compared, something like that. That's the methodology. Results: the students' marks uh, when they adopt, when we adopt the uh, adopt the traditional method of teaching, was this for recall questions, this for analytical questions. And then the, uh, when we use the activity base, the, there are marks for recall component is like this, and the analytical component is like this. And then there you might do, because they are quantitative numbers, uh, you might say that the difference is significant, the p-value is this, that's the results. So your conclusion will be something like, uh, this study shows that using uh, activity-based learning in teaching science, is useful and it enhances students' capacity to respond to uh, higher order questions. So, the recommendation uh, many of our traditional teaching science uh, we can shift to activity based learning. I'm just suggesting an ordinary thing. So, that would be those are the sort of specific sentences that you have to write for that 300 words. Well, I'm reminding you at that uh, true wisdom is knowing you, is, is in knowing you know nothing. That's why I say that I can't teach anything to anybody because I know nothing. And, and in fact, I can only facilitate. I think so far I have been trying to facilitate learning. I'm not giving you the final teaching because I also know only a little about education research and we need to learn together. So when it comes to the presentation, there will be a one lecture on how to do presentation. Uh, my advice is to sort of your time is limited only seven minutes and uh, 
make best use of that time. And probably you need to have a first slide where you write the topic and the author's name, and then you give an introduction. As I said in the previous uh, abstract, you say that uh, activity-based learn the, the students fail or students are not strong in uh, responding to the uh, analytical type of questions, critical thinking type of question, and the activity-based learning is supposed to help in improving the student's capacity in critical thinking and analytical level of questions. Maybe that you have some uh, literature in that. And then your objective, you will write only one sentence to enhance uh, students' achievement in higher order questions in the exam by uh, teaching learning through activity-based learning. Methodology, you write exactly this is what was done. And there were two, uh, two topics in science subject was taught on activity-based, two topics, traditional method, and you, your test has two components, recall questions as well as application level questions. Results you present in one table, probably maybe two table, and you have uh, uh, results uh, for recall questions, high order questions, uh, section taught on traditional method, section and taught with activity base, and then your p values and you this thing. Maybe you have two slides, and then you have a you draw a conclusion, and then you say there is a significant difference in uh, responding to the analytical and application level of questions when they learn through activity based learning. And your recommendations may be that. Uh, why not we change all to activity-based learning and where you might refer to more literature and say that uh, not only the performance and the exam, but also uh, there are impact on their behaviors, attitudes, collaborative uh, functions and communication skills, character building and all that if you engage in activity in the process of learning. But here in this study, we have shown only the advantage in uh, responding to the high order questions, and then you might have acknowledgement. So these are all imaginary thing that, that I have presented, I am talking about, but then uh, uh, you can do the study and prove that case. And then having done that, probably that was 29th October, you are presenting that paper, and uh, many of you all may have won an award for this uh, presentation and uh, recognize and island wide and probably that conference will be one of uh, national conference and where uh, thousands of teachers will watch your presentation and not only local and we are thinking of uh, gathering an uh, international audience uh, most of our old boys from the Raja college not only old boys but also all the sri lankans uh, expatriates uh, those who are living in various countries uh, we are going to invite uh, to watch this uh, conference and I think they will like it because they are going to look at the education system where they thrive, they have learned and they have sort of, you know, make best use of it. And those who are in other countries doing various all forms of jobs and very, very high ranking people are going to look at you, look at your presentations and talk with you in singular English or Tamil language. And uh, we did a rehearsal yesterday, and we had uh, two from USA, uh, one from Australia, and uh, in fact, there was one from Singapore to join, but couldn't do it. So it is interesting, and it's just getting back and talking with them again, once again, and de developing collaborations, relationships, and wherever in the world we are living. Uh, we are Sri Lankan, so so that is another important thing that is going to happen in this conference. And in fact, as much as we have invited them in this uh, corona epidemic to visit, come back to Sri Lanka for safety. Uh, so we are going to talk to them again uh, to come and sort of talk with us and get engaged in this discussion. So that is what is going to happen in the conference. And I can assure you, uh, do.
change this uh, culture, change this country. So uh, finally, uh, the next thing you have to do is that you have to uh, think of writing a full paper. Very soon we will publish the journal uh, of uh, education research journal and uh, you can write a full paper where you can write a long description, maybe 3000 words or 4000 words. And uh, so that should happen after the conference. You will be joining with us and we will encourage you to uh, uh, write that paper and we'll publish it so that we can share with everybody. So that's the end of uh, lecture series, the third lecture. And we will be continuing this series of lectures. Now, uh, these are the two lectures that I do, or three, third lecture. And there will be uh, about 10 more lectures uh, done by various eminent people. And soon after this lecture, there will be a lecture from a psychologist, Dr. Chaminda Veera Sirivardhana, who, is, who will be talking about various psychological problems that you encounter, that you will see in the schools. So discuss with him how to analyze them, how to eliminate them, uh, how to manage them, how can we help such children. So doing a research on uh, psychological problems in school is an important one. And not only that, there will be other doctors who will be discussing with you how to analyze and how to help in nutritional problems, behavioral problems, and their psychosocial problems. And there are education is coming in the series and go more into details of uh, various other theories in education, how to do the assessment and how to enhance activity-based learning. And there are education is coming. And there are education philosophers like uh, Dr. Sedar uh, will be talking to you and probably he will talk to you and how to make use of this education research uh, to improve the system. I mean, unless you try to improve the system, education research is of no use and actual research is for the purpose of improving the system. So that's going to be very useful and expect the the additional secretary in education and the director of uh, education research uh, talking to you about the practicalities of doing research and how the Ministry of Education helped you to do education research. So thank you. That is the end of my third lecture. Thank you.